Welcome to Leadership and People. This is a series that pulls back the curtain on leadership by interviewing CEOs, senior executives, and entrepreneurs who've had large exits. We ask these experts about how they built trusted networks to rapidly grow their companies and what advice they wish they knew if they could do it all again. Today, we've got part two of our episode with Carla Miney. I used to say I could just have great people and I would build an amazing company. But what I learned is now you have to have great technology to support those great people or they'll leave. Carla, thanks for making time. Thanks. So in part one, if you missed it, you should really go back and hear about uh, all of her journey and uh, inventing Occurrence, the inbound what, call center. Call center, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, very successful exit, investors 20 times their money, and then building Ideal Shape and now right. selling that. Yep. Um, let's talk about that for just a minute. Ideal okay. Shape. You know, in the last episode, we talked about, you know, it was a whole different business environment right. now that social media existed right. and stuff like exactly. that. Exactly. Um, what about making connections, like networking in the business environment? You know, you'd, you're you such a successful business person already, but you are starting something new. Right. What, you know, now starting this business, who did you want to go meet? What what kind of connections were you trying to make when you're CEO of, of this next business? Well, I think it was the same thing as with the call center business. Uh, even though it was a different business and it was online, I think those those things were different. I still wanted to connect with other CEOs because it's a lonely position. I mean, even with my investors, you really can't talk to your investors about a lot of different things. Uh, There was so much I could do, only so much I could do, talk with my husband. You didn't, you couldn't talk with your VPs and that group about really some things that are difficult at this. And certainly you couldn't say, man, I'm really struggling you know, if you ever got to that point. So um, I always was the one to seek out other CEOs. And then we'd have these great conversations about, oh, yeah. I remember one time I was set up with uh, Marilyn Tang in a in a chamber meeting for mentors and and other and she'd been in business 30 years and she ran a warehousing where they you know, they um, design warehouses. And I thought, oh, I can't really learn a lot from her. What, what can you, and I spent that year with her. It, we'd meet once a month for lunch and then we'd go to a meeting at the chamber. And that was one of the best years because I would say, well, I'm really struggling with this. this, this. Oh yeah, that's easy. That, you know, I've been there, done that. And she'd be telling me stuff and I'm like, Oh, and she goes, don't worry. Don't get upset. Don't do this. Don't, you know, it's not worth it and th- things like that. And so I was like, okay, I need to meet more CEOs. These are the people that I need to spend time with just because we get it. You know, there isn't a CEO that you meet that you have a conversation that you don't go, yeah, I've had that or thanks for sharing that with me. That was so great. That's just what I needed to hear. And, and how did you meet Jeff Rust and the whole Corporate Alliance folks? Um, they came and suggested that we go to our business. I can't even remember. It was so long ago. It was back in with the current days. And then, uh, we started up with them at Idle Shape and that's when it was really beneficial because we actually bought into not just the C level, but we got some of our employees going to the mid level and the entry levels and really started using the network. But I have to say we you know, some of the people that we met through Corporate Alliance have been really key in our success to the business. So it was a great relationship. And we talked about occurrence growing from, you know, our initial 10 staff yeah. to the 600 before yeah. we sold it. What was, what would, what at ideal shape, what did that look like from? So we just had our family working for us. There was five of us when we started. And uh, when we sold, we had over 100 employees. And in an online business, that's a lot of employees. We were, and we were outsourcing most everything. By then, we were outsourcing the shipping and packing and all of that because that had gotten too big. And uh, we were selling, um, you know, 10,000 a day customers. And so it was, it was big. So for, let's say there's business owners or division managers listening today that wish they had, they could grow their customer base to 10,000. Yeah. What do you feel like are, are some of the, the lessons on sales and attracting customers that you couldn't have learned if you hadn't have done this yourself? Oh, lessons on sales. Um, I think 
okay, for me, I'm always about operations. And so I think how you do a great job of selling is you deliver. So for me, our customer service had to be stellar. And I was always about getting the package right out, uh, answering the customer's questions immediately, helping them to understand how the product worked and if they had a problem with the product, replacing it or exchanging it or just giving them a refund. I felt like that's the way you grow your sales base because especially in this industry, online fitness, it's a big time referral business. It's a big time. I've had success. How much weight have you lost? Oh my gosh, look at you. Oh yeah, I'm doing idle shape. So, so our son ran the uh, marketing side of it. So he did place the ads that got people interested. But what happened is you can, if you're placing ads on social media, you better have a decent social media presence with people who are talking good about you. So when people would re, re, you know, they'd see the ad and then they'd go to Idle Shape and they'd look at our customers and see how many of them were complimenting us and how many of them loved the product and thought it was great and thanked us for our great customer service. All the things we had a group that was answering social media right away and on top of it, uh, then people ordered. You know, they said, well, I'm going to try this. You know, my friend is doing it or so-and-so is doing it. I'm going to try it. So I think the reason that the social media marketing was so effective, because initially we started with Google marketing and that was working for a while, but it really what, what really launched us was learning how to place Facebook ads and, and then doing Facebook private groups where people were in them and they could talk about things that their friends wouldn't see them and they would post before and after pictures, which you could never get them to do in a, in an open group. And so things like that we did that gave our, our customers a safe place to, to have those conversations and find a support group and find a group of people that were positive and uplifting. And because it's a tough thing, especially when a lot of them were lo- trying to lose over a hundred pounds, 150 pounds. It's, it's a lot. So, you know, it's an interesting topic, customer service, right? I, I can't think of a CEO or, or any kind of division leader I've ever met that thinks they have bad customer service. Right. But yet there's those people who are like, you know, you, you hear about um, Jeff Bezos at Amazon buying mm-hmm. Zappos. He says, I get weak in the knees when I find a customer obsessed company. Yes. Right. Yes. And I mean, people love to tell themselves how good they are at customer service. And then every once in a while you meet people who are like, deeply empathetic, consistently thinking, what's it like to be my customer, trying to give everything faster. Um, Any thoughts for people to do a self-assessment of, am I drinking my own Kool-Aid? I'm good at customer service versus, you know, am I, would I really fit in customer obsessed? Right. You know? Well, now you, you've got Google reviews and Facebook reviews and all of that. So you get pretty good feedback. If you want to find out how you're doing, go to your social media fo- platform. Just watch the feed. I watched the feed all the time. Um, I would have it running on my computer as I'm doing other things. And I'd kind of watch. And if something happened negative, man, I... But the funny thing is somebody would make a negative comment like, I don't like this chocolate chip mint shake mix you know our customers would jump in and they would go it's great I love it try this try that I was like okay we really don't even have to jump in on this one because we got all these customers jumping in so you get a sense because if your customers don't do that and you're getting that kind of message on your social media and reviews um, you're getting instant feedback and recognizing if somebody makes a negative comment there are 50 people that didn't bother you know, so take it at face value because someone had the guts to make it. So you better really look at it and say, what can I do to fix this? You know, it's so interesting, this idea of you can't manage what you're not measuring. Right. Right. And yet uh, in a lot of organizations, senior executives, there's a little bit of like nobody wants to get shot for being the messenger. Right. On bad news. Right. Yeah. So having something like this where you have a feedback loop that is. Yeah that it's, you're, you're, nobody's jeopardizing their job to let the boss know we've no, got a problem, no, right? exactly. Which ideally, you've invented the kind of culture where yeah. that doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. And in reality, politics are politics and not all your managers are as good as you hope they are. Exactly. Right? 
Um, but it, it's interesting how many parts of life, if we would just measure it, right? If, if we would, I think people try to have the self-discipline to measure instead of building a system that will measure for them. Right. Right. Cause then you, mm-hmm. then I procrastinate, then my willpower falls down. Now, so yeah. now I'm not measuring. Right. Right. Exactly. And it's not easy. I mean, a lot of times setting up metrics is a, is a lot of work, but it does. Once you've set them up and you manage them according, accordingly, it's actually an easy way to manage people. But a lot of people struggle with setting up the matrix and figuring out what is it that I'm going to measure this person on and how am I going to do that? And I say, go to the person and say, okay, I'm going to measure you. What do you want to be measured on? Start there and then say, well, those are good ideas, but I also want to measure this and this and this. And they're like, well, how would you do that? Then we come up with this idea and then we set some goals and we start from a place of let's help make you successful. I'm not trying to make you not successful. I'm trying to make you successful. So let's make you successful. Let's set you up to be successful. And then, uh oh, you're slipping here or here. And it's, if you give immediate feedback, it's loving, concerned, you know, I care about you. People respond really well. I mean, they really do want to do a really good job. It's, it's rare. Every once in a while you have somebody that came, that got through the interview process. Heavens knows how, that could care less. It's like, who hired this person? How'd they get in this company? Because they really don't care and they can't be here anymore. We, you know, they, and I'm quick with letting people go because I, I, my feeling is I'm stopping them from being in an organization that fits them better. So if this isn't working out and we've tried the, here's our p- performance improvement plan, let's see what we can do and watch them not even make any move towards success, I go, you know what? This isn't working and it's not working. It's not just not working for us. It's not working for you. You need to find a place where you can be successful. You're not being successful here. And people are like, yeah, you're right. I don't really like it. Or, I mean, I rarely get the person that goes, oh, what? You're letting me go? You know, I mean, they know it's coming. They, we've, we've set it up so that they already, I always say, they fire themselves. I don't fire anybody. I just go, I, most people walk in my office and I didn't do a lot of the firing later in the years. I had people that did it, but when they did, they'd go, you're firing me, aren't you? And I go, no, you're firing yourself. And they go, yeah, you're right. I mean, yeah, it was pretty typical. People always knew and I always turned it around and said, no, you, you fired yourself because I tried I tried everything I could to help make you successful, but you know what? It's not a good fit. That's okay. Somewhere else is a good fit for you and go be successful and tell me about how great the next position is for you. I want to hear about it because we got to cut you loose so that you can go find it. I love it. Uh, It's interesting. I think about whether it's at small businesses or whether I was CEO of a private equity fund, so many of my thinking I'm being nice by keeping people around was a terrible choice. Kills everybody else's morale. Why are they still here when they're right. acting like that? Right. I think I'm being nice. Really, I'm just avoiding conflict. Right. You know, not, you know. Well, and, you know, I told you about Paul Barrett. I remember the biggest thing he taught. One of the biggest thing he taught me was he taught the, the, the analogy where you you have you have the dogs, the bottom 10 percent of the company, and then you have the the herd, which is the 80% in the middle, and then you have the 10% tigers at the top. And so he would say, you unleash the tigers and you let them be hugely successful because you're tying them down with all these rules that you, you let the tigers perform and you really go for it. The herd goes, whoa, look at those guys. Oh, well, that's okay. We still have these dogs down here. We're okay. And then you shoot the dogs and get rid of them. And the herd goes, whoa, whoa, they shot the dogs. Oh, man. And they start to improve because the herd improves when there's no dogs below them and they see the tigers taking off. So that's what Paul Barrett taught me. And it was, it's been true. It's been true. My whole career, I've found numerous times that I've improved performance by getting rid of the people that are dragging everybody down and unleashing the tigers that really perform. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Okay. Next I want to ask is, you know, there's so many entrepreneurs who have a small business and they want to be a, they want to become a big business. Right. And there's, there's 
so many that don't make it. Right. When you think about, when you think about the ones that could have that don't, what do you think people are missing? What do you think people are not doing? Those small businesses that could become a big business, but they don't. Well, first of all, they're missing vision. I think you have to have vision. Uh, I typically find if I can see it, I can make it happen. So I try to say, okay, what can we do next? What can we do to improve, to become better, to be successful, you know, more, wh whatever it is. And so they might be lacking vision and the ability to see. They might be lacking the ability to surround themselves with great people. I've known a lot of entrepreneurs and they struggled with hiring people better than themselves. Um, and, you know, they, they want to keep everything. They want to do it all. And they, they, they struggle with letting things go. So my philosophy has always been, okay, hire somebody who's better at this than I am. Let it go. And then I can go over here and do this more. Um, I have a really good example was my husband was when he came, he came in the call center business with me, he said, why are you still doing your bookkeeping? And so well, I said, well, you know, I we have all these friends that have job, you know, companies that got embezzled from, I don't want to make sure that happens. He's like, you know what, you're, you got to find a $12 an hour person, just do the bookkeeping, put some controls in so you can be out selling more. And I go, I know I need to do that, but that is really hard. So we had this great conversation. I finally did it. It's the best decision I made, you know, get, get that bookkeeping off of me. And, and then I went out and was selling and we doubled the business that year. And so, you know, it was a good lesson. I thought I was really good at it, but then I found typical entrepreneur holding on to certain things. And so as the years have gone on, I'm, I've gotten way better at letting things go, but I do meet a lot of entrepreneurs that just can't let go things go. They can't, th even if they hire a really amazing person, they usually can't work with them. Like they can't handle that. They're so much better than them at something. So ego probably gets into it or something like that. But so those were the things, you know, you have, have, have to have vision, you have to hire great people, let things go. And you do the things you're really good at to help build the business. So thinking about this idea of, you know, I, I think about one of my mentors, um, he used to talk about, he, he had grown up in a family of entrepreneurs. His dad had, you know, convenience stores at gas stations and stuff. Mm -hmm. And he'd say like, um, you know, son, you have to, you just have to know that when you leave the store, the staff are going to do a worse job than you would have sure. if you'd stayed. Right. But the trade off is you get to have dinner with your family. Sure. Yeah. You know, so how does somebody walk that balance beam of abdication where it becomes a free for all and, and, and people are making choices that aren't right for the business right? versus micromanaging the company isn't growing the the guy at the top the gal at the top is a big bottleneck right any thoughts about how to get on the balance beam in the middle well you you have to set it as a priority so you have to say okay these this is a priority to me so i want to have family time i want to be able to not be always at the business and when i had a call center business it was 24 7 we never got a day off so it was really easy to work a lot and, uh, so you got to set that priority and then it's, it's really back to just hiring great people because if you hire great people and then you manage them, they really will do a good job, even though it may not be the job that you would do. For example, Mrs. Fields cookies would come into the store and she'd look at these cookies and go, I would never serve these cookies. You know, she'd just like lose it over the quality of one tray of cookies. The rest of them look great, but this one tray and she'd just be like, when I ran a cookie store, you know, the, the cookies always look like, but then I go, but you're the owner, Debbie, you know, they're, they're not going to run it like you would. Well, they should, you know, and she was just so adamant and it was really hard to help her see we're doing a great job hiring people for what you're giving us to pay them and everything, but they're never going to treat it as their own. That's why I always put in commission programs. So they always made more money when the company made more money, bonus programs. And I even did stock option programs. Every company I've sold our employees, the long-term high level employees always did really well because I believed in, 
I was always more successful when I did that anyway. So giving up a percentage of the business to those people, giving up part of the bottom line to those people always paid big dividends. So I'm a strong believer in that one. I love it. Um, so thinking about this idea, um, you know, you look at labor market right now, you know, there's, there's a lot of help wanted in yes. our, in our yes. state. Yeah. Okay. Right now, right. just for this year, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> Besides paying a little more, any other philosophies on getting good people? Uh, you know, how do you know the difference between somebody that interviews well versus somebody that's actually going to perform? Well, I, I have a philosophy about that. I, I do scenarios. And so people have learned how to interview, but they don't, they don't know scenarios. Like I'll set up a scenario for a customer service. I'm like, okay, this, this is what the customer calls you and says, you don't know our policies. What is, how would you handle this? Because I want to know how they believe, right? What they think, how they, not what they think I want to hear. And you do, I do 10, 15, 20 scenarios by the time I'm getting, depending on the level of, and for the most part, I find out I'm hiring, I'm hiring their talents, their skills, their abilities, their heart. I'm not hiring necessarily their education. Uh, I'm, I, I want to know who they really are. And are they going to be a good fit for our company? So I do that. And so I, for, first off, I think it's a good interview, and the ability to interview well and then listen to what they're really saying. And then the second thing is, is once you get them in, is matching them up with a good manager and then helping that manager help them to be successful. So I always made them come in. So a manager had to come in and buy off on a person. So they had to say, yep, I want, I'm on my team. So I would say, okay, now your job is to help make him successful because you wanted him. So it, it really, the person really had to be a super bad match to not make it because we've tried everything along the way to set them up and to be really, really successful. Um. What did that look like? Your your manager mentoring. What what did that look like at your companies of them making sure somebody's successful? Is it back to measuring and having conversations about? Yeah. So so they had teams, and so we the team the person individual was had metrics, but the team also had metrics. So the manager was man was was their performance bonuses, their commissions, you know how promotions were all measured based on how their team did. And we didn't look at individuals in that scenario. We looked at their team. So if they had one bad apple and they kept them and then dragged the team down, it's like, mm, yeah, no, you shouldn't do that. You know, you've, you've got a team to support here and you're dragging down the whole team by keeping that person who, who just has a bad attitude for whatever reason. So they did get through the system and, the, and then they were hired. But um, no, we measured, we measured, I don't know too many positions in my companies. I didn't measure. I'm just really vigilant about that. I think everybody does better if they n know what the measurement is, they understand it, they agree to it, and they know that every week we're going to meet about it. Yeah. Well, thinking about this idea of vision and leadership, and you know, I know we're about done uh, out of time here with okay. part two of the episode, but maybe this is a good question to end with. Um, when you think about leading the kind of business that is attractive for somebody else to buy, yes, right? Do you have any thoughts about this? About building the kind of company that's a, that's attractive for an exit? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, we did a we did a few different things, and and I didn't manage. I didn't push this one as much as my husband did. Was having a, amazing technology. I used to say I could just have great people, and I would build an amazing company. But what I learned is now you have to have great technology to support those great people or they'll leave because they won't work with crappy, I guess I shouldn't have said that word, but <laughs> crummy um, technology. They just won't stay there. So, so he built systems and processes and programs to help support really great people so they had this great environment to work in and great technology. And then it was attractive to investors because they came in and saw the cool technology that we had developed and the way we managed it. And then they met our people 
And, you know, the bottom line is they're looking at numbers. They're looking at how, how, how fast have you grown the business? How successful have you been at managing your costs? And what's the bottom line? And, and what was your growth rate over a certain amount of years? So, you know, they're all still, the, what gets them excited is the numbers. But when they come in, great technology and great people is, is usually what seals the deal, as I found. This last group that bought us, they came in from England and they approached us through email, actually, and they looked at and they'd seen our business. So they David flew out there and gave them all of the information on our business, but what sealed the deal is they came out in July and they met all of our people, and then they were just blown away by the the level of of expertise in our in, in, in their field, but mostly how everybody was so excited to work for our company and really positive, and so that's what really sealed the deal. That's great. That's great advice. Well, thanks for spending so much time with us. Yeah, I'm glad. It was great. Thank you. Hello in there.